If it's a good number tonight, I'm glad I'm saved, sealed, and satisfied in Jesus. I hope you are as well. Amen. Who's a couple getting married? Where are they at? I'm just the one person. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I just want to give you a little advice. Did you know that kissing husbands, the husbands that kiss their wives every morning before leaving for work usually a five years longer than those who don't kiss their wives? A kissing husband has fewer car accidents, loses up 50% less time from work because of illnesses. He earns 20 to 30% more than a non-kissing husband. No stats, no stats on kissing wife. So just remember that. <laughs> just kiss and kiss and kiss her. I don't like that. <laughs> An elderly preacher uh, advised his young preacher friend that if he ever forgot the marriage ceremony to start quoting scripture until he remembered, the second wedding, sure enough, uh, the young preacher forgot, and the only scripture that he could remember was, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. <laughs> so I thought you give a little encouragement here. I just thought I'd try to encourage the best I could anyway. At Sunday school, they were teaching how God created everything, including human beings. Little Johnny seemed especially intent, but they told him how Eve was created out of one of Adam's ribs. Later in the week, his mother noticed him lying down as though he were ill and said, Johnny, what is the matter? Little Johnny responded, I have pain in my side. I think I'm going to have a wife. I thought, <laughs> oh, that's enough. <laughs> Turn with Revelation chapter 21, if you will, please. Revelation chapter 21. And uh, pray for us. We want to bring a message tonight on 12 gates. And looking at... Uh, Chapter 21, I usually just I thought about reading just the one verse, that is verse 13 is where our text is. But it's such good verses in, in the uh, early part of the chapter, I'd like to just read that as well. Because it's telling about what we're going to inherit, where we're going. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. I like this verse, and this is a, a, finally the conclusion when all tears will be wiped away. There's going to be some tears in heaven. I got a feeling there's going to be a lot of them at the judgment seat of Christ. And probably at the, at the great white throne judgment. This is after these things have, have uh, taken place. And so I, it tells me we're going to have some tears that's going to be shed. We won't go into the details of that. But in God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be no more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. Are you thirsty tonight? He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful and the unbelieving, and the abominable, and murderers, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars have, shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, full of the uh, seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will, show thee the, I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away into the, uh, in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me the, that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Having the glory of God, and her light was likened to a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. And had a wall, had a, had a, and had a wall great and high, and had twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. On the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates, and the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. May we pray. Father. Thank you for the songs that the choir and the quartet have sung tonight. It's been such a blessing. And Father, to have our hearts refreshed when we think about the songs that have been ministered to us this evening. 
And Lord, when we think about the songs in summation, I think about how that Jesus loves me. This I know because the Bible tells me so. And I thank you, Lord, and I pray the Spirit of God will use this tonight. We know that we're not the one to bring, uh, Father, any great power moving in the, in the service. It takes the Spirit of God to do that. And I pray, Lord, that you'll help me tonight. And Father, special all of us, that we'll never get over the wonder of it all in serving Christ. In Jesus' name that I do ask and pray. Amen. Let me make one comment in verse 22 uh, and read you just one thought about the last curse that's going to be handy upon this earth. And it was talking about in verse number 5 of 22, it says, There shall be no night there. I uh, got a message on that, and it's really good preaching when you think about it. That'll be the last removal of a curse, there'll be no night there. I read of a barber's convention a number of years ago, and it was a convention nationally held in the city of New York. And being held in the city of New York, the steering committee went to work hiring a publicity genius and advertising the gathering. Money was no object on the convention for the barbers. They wanted to make America conscious that the barbers were meeting in New York. Now we realize today that that, that has happened a long number of years ago, but I, I thought the story was rather interesting. The agent went to the Bowery of the city, a section of town where defeated human beings congregate, he found a young man who, underneath the rough exterior, possessed a handsome facial feature. He asked this young man, or asked this man, if he would like to make some money. And the man said, sure. And of course, said the derelict, actually, the agent said, well, come with me and do as I say. He took him to the uh, photographer and then had a picture made of the young man with his tattered clothes, unshaven face, and uncombed hair. Then he took him to a barber for a haircut, then back to the photographer for the picture number two. He took him back to the barber for a shave, uh, uh, now back to the photographer for picture number three. He took him back to the barber then again and told him to give him the works, that's the shampoo, the massage. And then he took him to get him a new suit and shirt and all the trimmings. Back to the barber, I mean back to the photographer or the barber rather for picture number four. The agent had the four photographs that had taken of this young man, made into life-size proportions, and placed them in sequence in the foyer of the hotel and where the barbers were congregating. Beneath the four pictures, he inserted the caption, this is what the barbers of America can do for you, or can do for a man. It was a miraculous transformation when they looked at it. One could see the change in this man's life, and on the, of course, and on the, uh, uh, as the pictures were observed in their sequence of the first one to the fourth one. Of course, picture one and picture four did not look or seem like the, the same man at all. But when the young man walked into the lobby of the hotel, everyone knew that he was the person involved in the publicity stunt. And it worked. The newspaper picked up the story and it was, of course, uh, sent to every part of the country in their day. Now, soon the convention came to a close. The brother, barbers went to their, uh, to their work in their distant cities, and one of the management managers of the hotel became uh, interested in the young man. He asked him what he was going to do after uh, the convention was ended and his services were no longer needed. And the young man replied that he didn't know what he was going to do. And so, therefore, the, uh, young, uh, uh, the, the manager asked him to return the next day and said, I'll find a position for you and give you a job. And of course, young man was expressed great delight and said uh, that he would return tomorrow. Of course, he did not return in two days, two weeks had gone by. The manager wondered what ever happened to him. And a few months later, he saw him in the Bowery. And of course, he was filthy, his hair was a mess, face unshaven, the suit all filthy and torn. Uh, and he, he stumped because of what he'd, uh, he'd already got back into the old ways of life. The young man had relapsed back to his former ways of doing things. He was a victim of drink and drugs and so forth and so on, and he'd gone back to his old ways. The barbers of America can do wonders for a man on the outside, but this young man needed something done for him on the inside. He had no inner resources. He was a pawn of evil forces that dominated his whole life. That is why Jesus left the environment of heaven 
And of course, and he wanted to do something for a man on the inside. And man can doctor up the exterior, but only God, but only God can give us strength and then wisdom to meet the many problems of life that all of us face and to overcome the temptation, temptations that dog our steps from the cradle to the grave. Only that can come about with a new birth. That's the only way that will ever be accomplished in anybody's life. I, I can dress, we can dress up anything or anybody and make them look good. But unless they've had a genuine uh, new birth experience, they're basically, uh, in time, will revert back to the old ways and the old nature of doing things. So you need Christ in your life. We all need Christ in our life. Our conditions will not always be favorable, any of us. Storms and troubles will come. The real question is, what are you on the inside? How are things on the inside with you? God knows our frame. He knows that we are dust, and he wants to help us make the most of life that we possibly can. Surrender your all, of course, and all of Jesus I surrender. He's our friend, and he, of course, he wants to be your friend as well. In our text before us, we have a description of that holy city that we're going to. The writer describes the dazzling beauty of that city called the New Jerusalem that's coming down from heaven. The writer, of course, but in the midst of this lavish resume of its marvelous uh, uh, magnificence, John reminds us of the many doors that lead into that particular city. Now, there are 12 gates on the east, there are 12 gates on the north, there are 12 gates on the south, and there are 12 gates on the west. Man, and of course, the 12 gates and all, and the, uh, of course, an apple enough interest for every individual to get into the city. And there are three gates on each side. The number three, of course, might be some, uh, significant, or, significant uh, or symbolic. That is the number of men, body, soul, and spirit, or God's or Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. But uh, that's another thought within itself. There is no excuse. Every man can be saved and enter into the joys of Christian living. I don't care what one's conditions in life might be uh, faced with or might be, but nevertheless you'll discover that three gates await the entrance of everyone of going into that city. Now, what I'm, uh, I'm not saying that there are four different ways of getting to heaven. Uh, we're already there, of course, as being God's children. There's only one way, Jesus said, I'm the way. There's only one door of getting into heaven. But what I want you to see is, uh, uh, you might say symbolically or representing uh, uh, all of the classes of people uh, that will be entering into that city. And uh, in other words, if you look at the east, you'll find the, uh, and take the four parts of the compass, the east represents the rising sun or youth, and you can enter through those gates. Uh, the north represents winter and the struggles of life, you can enter through those gates. Uh, the south represents warmth and prosperity. You can enter through those gates. The west represents the setting sun of old age, and you can enter through those gates as well. In other words, you've already, you've, you're already, you've already entered through the door, but after going through the door, which one of those particular gates would we, uh, you know, that we'd be able to enter in if we wanted to use it in that light? That I was a young person, or I was in a bad health, or I was in old age, or I was in uh, prosperity, which would be the way. So I think you can see what I'm speaking about. On the east are three gates. Now when I think about the east, the east represents the rising of the sun or the beginning of the day. And youth is symbolized in this figure. Young people that are here tonight, uh, this symbolizes you this evening. Youth with all of its strength and its wonderful opportunities is here shown and there's something dynamic about youth. Uh, I think we'd all really agree with that. It's winsomeness and it's charming and admirable. I think of Moses standing on the mount after a fruitful life. And I think we can all visualize Moses, Moses his hair is bleached. And time has drawn deep lines into his aging face as well. But think of, but think of young Moses. Think of when Moses was just a young man standing in Pharaoh's court. Refusing to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. I mean, it took some intestinal fortitude and some stamina and the grace of God uh, for him to stand as being a young man and say, I'm choosing rather to suffer the affliction of God's people rather to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Amen. So think about Moses. I want you to think about Daniel. He has respect of a pagan court 
when you read the book of Daniel, the glow of faithful service in, the, in his feeble lives. But I like to think of Daniel. I want you to, to think of Daniel, that young Daniel, as he stands in the court of the heathen potentate and refuses to eat the king's meat and said, He, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, just teenage boys, and say, We're not going to eat the king's meat. So we like to think about Daniel, of course, his old race and the lion's den, how he was delivered. But go back when Daniel was a young man. And Moses, when he was a young man. And you that are young men and young ladies and teenagers as well that are here, uh, you've got that opportunity uh, that's facing you to take a, a, a permanent and a firm stand of those who try to entice you uh, to get involved in drugs and in sex and other immoral acts. In this society, you've got a chance and an opportunity that's glorious and to let them know that Jesus means more to you than all what the world's got to offer. Amen. I was saved when I was 18 years old in a service. I may been home going to all of that. But I remember after that I was saved and I was a member of Woodland Baptist Church, Zeno Gross was my pastor. And us young boys, I remember that uh, in Northside Shopping Center and uh, the place where we used to go and where they was having dances on Friday night, Saturday night, and uh, we would go in there with our tracks because we knew them. And it might have been maybe not appropriate to do that. I don't know. We just want to witness to people and let our friends know we've been saved because we want to see them saved. But we didn't last long in there. There was no ruckus that went on. They just asked us quietly if we would leave. And we did that. We were going to try to create any problem. But sometimes I wonder now, as I've gotten older as well, would I have that intestinal fortitude and that zeal and that zip to go in a place like that? But yet young people have a no fear about them. When you get saved as being a 16, 17, 18, sometimes even younger than that, I do discover that teenagers are fearless. That's the reason they like to get them in the service when they're just uh, fresh out of high school. Most teenagers are going to tackle anything. And boy, I'll tell you one thing. When God saves your soul, then I'll be like a young Daniel uh, that said, I'm not going to eat the king's meat. Be like a young Moses that said, I'm not going to. Uh, I, I'm, gonna, in, I'm not going to uh, eat the Pharaoh's uh, meat. I'm going to uh, follow God's people and uh, suffer affliction rather than draw the place of sin for a season. Think of old Joseph. We think of him. He, uh, of course, he saved the world from famine. I think maybe sometimes around in our area we might need an old Joseph in our area as well. But he's won the admiration and the esteem of multitudes because of his keen insight into the future. And, but I like to think of young Joseph. And relating his dream to his jealous brothers, I see him refuse the enticements of an attractive queen, and he suffers for righteousness sakes and is placed in prison. So think about the eastern gate, the rising sun, and the youth of everyone that's here tonight uh, that is not married and maybe you're going to be placed up like this couple is going to be doing, uh, but nevertheless in the, uh, uh, the rising sun of your life, when God has given you the strength and the courage and the mentality and the zip and the zeal to get out there and get something done for God. And you need to use that. Millions and millions, by the way, God loves the young. He knows their problems. He sympathizes with uh, the many adjustments that they must make in the growing process of being a young person. So he's opened the gates of the East and let them in. Millions of young people have entered through these gates. I would say to every young person present now is accepted time. Today's the day of salvation. Amen. Not tomorrow, but today. Right now is accepted time. Right. Don't let the devil uh, whisper sweet nothings in your ear. Uh, that we'll do it some other time. We'll get uh, notice whenever. Th well, I've got, I've got to do a few errands first of all. Don't let the devil whisper them sweet nothings uh, in your ear, and that will just lead to nothing and probably to problems. By the way, but say, come to Jesus even tonight, Amen. because and accept Him. Today is the day yes. of salvation, and now yes. is the accepted time. Yes. That's when we need to make some commitments. Amen. You do not have to sow your wild oats on where people get that idea from. And you do not have to take the low road and minimize the effectiveness that may be yours in days to come. Salvation that Christ offers will awaken every potential that resides within you if you'll just give your heart and life to Christ. Amen. It makes all the difference. Some say, I'll do this when I can give up this or that. Uh, then I'll be saved. No, you won't. Uh, the devil's uh, uh, feeding you a lie 
and say, well, I, will I get a job? Will I get married? Will I get everything settled? Will I get my, uh, you know, uh, uh, all of my ducks in a row and all those things? The devil has fooled them into thinking that a salvation is subtraction. It is not subtraction. It is not a minus. The cross is a plus sign. And a plus sign means redemption is, a, is, a, is, is, a, is, a, is addition. And Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God. Then these things will be added unto you. And that's addition. Hey. And he says, you to take care of the needs and supply those and the things you wear, your food. And he said, why take thought of those things? God said, I'll take care of them. So quit worrying about it. And just cast all your cares upon Jesus, young person. And give your life to him. And it makes a difference when you do that. Amen. I can verify that. I thank God that I say when I was 18. I, I wouldn't have cared if he saved when I was younger. But God knows what he's doing. Some of you are saved when you're younger. Some are saved when you're older. But the main thing is you got saved. Right. That's what's important about it. So youth is a time of preparation. It's a time of building foundations. No one is prepared to live until it becomes a Christian anyway. If the young person develops his mind and body and not his soul, he is, he is partially prepared. When God told Satan that Job was a perfect and an upright man, he meant that Job was complete. It doesn't mean he was uh, sinless and that no perfect in that sense of the word. But perfect has to do with the fact that you're a complete man. And therefore, uh, in other words, we're, we're, uh, God wants us all to be complete. And I want to see young people complete, not only uh, physically and mentally, but also spiritually. Because when they're spiritually complete and their soul, they've got a combatant within them, to help them fight the flesh. Listen, uh, I had battles in my uh, with the flesh even before I come to church tonight. You might not have, but I did. And the devil let so uh, so uh, weird things go through your mind. And I said, God, I, you help me. Uh, this old flesh uh, never gives up on anybody. Right. And you're going to have a time with that old flesh of the nature of yours till Jesus raptures us out and gives us a new body. You're going to have a battle on your hand. And I would suggest that you get in touch with Jesus, stay close to him as you possibly can, and develop the power of God in your life to live a victorious life for Christ, and God will fulfill your every need. Amen. And you'll have some victories in your life, soul winning victories. That's what's it. I remember the first soul I had the privilege of winning. A friend of mine, when I went to see him, told him I'd got saved and invited him to go to church with me, and he went with me to the house of God, and was sitting about the third pew from the front on this side, and he was under conviction. I said, I'll go with you, and we went up. And I didn't know how to win it, but I don't think I knew it just to get up to church. But I've never forgotten that. And I don't think you ever forget when you get to, when you have a part. The greatest thing that spirit you'll ever have, not only is your salvation uh, of the greatest experience and the greatest joy, but secondly, is when you win somebody else to Christ. It just feels like you're getting saved all over again. No, you don't do that, but I, I like the feeling anyway. I'm glad the Lord gives us feeling in Christianity and salvation. Some folks shout, some people cry. Some people run around, some people just look like an idol law, but I'm just he makes us, uh, you know, gets the thing. But if young people develop that, uh, his mind and body, not his soul, he's partially prepared. The Lord, the Lord wants every young person to be well rounded. This is what salvation and why salvation is so important. The story goes that a man got into a fight with it and he was killed. And on the tombstone, they placed this epitaph. He fought a good fight, but his razor was dull. Young people, you fight, you're fighting with a dull rage when you fight against the devil. Right. And you need to have the sharp tools of the Spirit of God to give you wisdom how to combat the enemy Amen. that you're facing day by day. Ask the man behind, listen, you think it's hard to be a Christian, it's hard not to be a Christian. Proverbs says the way of the transgressor is hard. Ask the man who lost control and lived for the flesh and ruined his health through liquor. Ask the man that was had the opportunity as a young man, but he got involved with the, the such crowd and the beer and other things, and then now he's gotten up and like his life is ruined. Ask that man uh, uh, if it's easy carrying an, uh, an afflicted body around because of what sin will do to a person when they has got a hold of them in their young life, caused by the moral rejection that he should have done when he was a teenager and a young person. He will answer, it would have been better to be sober and retain his health than to have, have come to this bitter end in his life. Let me give you another example. Ask the man behind bars. He stole, he lied, he cheated. <laughs> Did this bring him happiness? No, it didn't. But now he's suffering the results of a wasted life. And he said, I've just got to have a little bit more fun. 
And then now he's behind bars and locked up. And some of them, of course, get saved. But you know what? Wouldn't it have been better if he'd gotten saved and I'd use those uh, youthful energies for the glory of God and rather than having life ruined and ruin his family and his, uh, his wife probably and all those things because of saying, I've just got to have a little bit more fun. That's the woman who lived in sinful pleasures. Has she found it profitable in the long run TV may give you that impression about the woman and all those and they always pre present such a, a, a glorious experience. Everything looks so good, but they never show you the backside of the billboard. They never do that. And how the weeds have grown up and how dirty it is and, how, and the, the trash has been thrown behind the black. They never show that part. And uh, all of us are so gullible, we think that's what it's going to be, but it's not. It pays to serve Jesus, but it costs to serve the devil. The ways of sin is dead. So the gates of the east are open tonight. And every young person can be saved, and Christ loves a young person. He was young, uh, a, a young man when he died. His disciples were young men as well. Jesus loves the fire of youth. He knows it can be challenged, and it can sweep the world for the cause of Christ. And the youth can do that. Let me say this, and I'll get off the young, but the youth need Jesus, and I'll tell you why. When the storms of life are raging, you're going to need it. And when the fires of passion uh, kindle within your soul, you're going to need it. And when your friends turn their backs on you, you're going to need it. And when painful decisions need to be made, you're going to need it. And when your nerves are shattered, you are you're going to need him. So enter, I hope you'll be one of those that have entered the eastern gate. You're going to need it. Then let's look at the northern gate. The three gates on the north represent sorrow, the Jew to the Jew, the north uh, meant war and trouble and invasion. The enemy of Jews are coming from the north. The beginning of trouble may also be the beginning of wisdom to all of us, or to many of us. Joseph Parker once said, God allows men to take a trip to the sick bed so that they can look up and see God in the face. Some people never think of the infinite until the hour of darkness comes into their lives. Have you ever thought about the Philippian jailer, how he got saved? I know, uh, but I want you to think about something about that incident. The Philippian jailer never did ask what must I do to be saved until the earthquake came? And then the, the jailhouse doors were open. We know that jailhouse rock, you had that expression to be. All those things began to develop. And it came to Paul, uh, and Paul and Simon said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? God shook his cage, what happened? And in doing that, he said, and, and before then he thought nothing about it. He didn't think nothing about beating Paul and Silas. I mean, that was his job and his duty. He wasn't going to let, and if, those, uh, if they would have escaped, that would have been his life. And, uh, but nevertheless, he never thought about getting saved until uh, a, a tragedy came into his life. And then he said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And I like the simplicity of it. He said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thine household. And that was a verse that I claimed for me and my wife after that God saved us, we were married. And of course, in 1960, and then uh, that God would uh, uh, save our family when, our, of course, when our daughter came, our son came, and uh, God saved them. But that was a verse that was my claim uh, for my family that God was saving, that it would be saved in thy household because I did not want my kids to go to hell. I hope you don't want yours to go there either. But there are many of them that goes there, and we need to get to develop a burden for those who are lost without Christ and that we might see them saved before it's eternally too late. So the beginning of trouble, so that uh, we should not wait until the hour of heartache is upon us before we think about the Lord. Yet God knows the quirks of human nature. He has obeyed, He has opened three doors on the north. The Valley of Achor, in the book, of course, in the book of Numbers, I mean the book of Joshua, remember about concerning uh, Achor, what he had done, got stolen, then of course his family was stoned, uh, was stoned to death in the Valley of Achor. In Hosea chapter 2, verse 15, was changed in the valley, uh, the valley of Hope. It's called that the Valley of Achor or a door of Hope. And if you win by accepting Christ as your Savior and comfort of your souls, it would be worth the pain and the trial and the trouble that you might endure. Listen, you remember the prophet Jonah did not see the, uh, the need of answering the call of God until he ran into the storm and then was swallowed by a whale. The children of Israel had to be reduced to slavery and poverty before they would eliminate their pride and repent. A pastor tried to win a young couple to the Lord and uh, their infant child had died. And at the cemetery, they waited, of course, till the, all, this, you know, all the, the prayers and the scripture readings and 
So he stayed behind with the mom and dad, just a young couple, and with their infant child. And of course, and the husband said, I want to see this baby again. I don't know if I, uh, he says, I know that I won't if I don't accept Christ as my Savior. And the wife, she was reaping along with her husband and said, uh, I, 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 won't see, I want to be saved. I won't see my baby unless I get saved. Now, the death of the child became the birth of two people into the family of God. I do not know how God's going to do things. I'm not God. I'm just giving you a, an illustrated story of an event that happened. It reminds me of David. You remember when David's baby, and of course, by, by Bathsheba, and the baby was dying, and David did not eat. He wept, and of course, he cried and prayed and so forth. And then when they came and told him the news that the baby had gone, was dead, and then the Bible says that David dressed, he washed himself, and went to the house of God and worshipped. He said, I cannot I bring my child back, but I can go to be with my child. Boy, that's a comfort to me. And to know that I can't bring, but I know that one of these days, those little bit infants that uh, this nation has aborted, they just actually are building the bride of Christ, and it's already about some 300 million or three million, however many it is now, but they're just making the bride of Christ even uh, uh, greater and more, heaven more populous than we can imagine. And it's not going to be just heaven consistent, but this little group here, and us tonight, us few and us four, no more. But I, it's going to be millions upon millions that are going to be there, and some of them are going to go by the north gate when they get to heaven. They've been that way through Sodom. And blood, I don't know what it's going to take. My daddy had cancer. And it took that to humble my dad down. I, I, I had a good father and a good mother, good provider. I was saved before my dad was, and my dad was 72 when he got saved. And uh, it took cancer to do that, to make him aware of that. I asked my pastor to talk with him. And one of the most memorable things in my ministry in its entirety was the first time in the, and I was preaching in the church and my, my son, father was sitting beside of my wife. And I still remember what I preached about that night. But, and that was a, a memento and a memorable time for me. Because later when my dad passed away in 19 and, uh, 50, 19 and 65, and, but I know where he's at, I'll see him again. But you know what, it took something like that, and it was worth it. I mean, I'm, I, I thank God for that which would awaken him to see the need of Christ and knowing that he's now in the presence of the Lord because one of these days, all these things are going to be over with anyway. And to see what's going to happen. An American boy got right with God in the foxhole, things of that nature. Then number three on the south, three gates, I've got to hurry here. The south represents blessings and prosperity. And we speak of sunny south as a symbol of happiness and success. God can be found in the lap of luxury. It is not easy to find God in the midst of plenty and pleasure. We all know that. More people have gotten away from the Lord in the hour of blessing than in the hour of despair. Yet there are three gates on the south, and God can be found through the blessings that surround us through those three gates on the south. Romans 2, 4 says, that the goodness of God leads you to, to repentance. We've seen capture many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord hath done. Psalms 103, verse 2. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not his benefits. Let me ask you all we forget. I think the inability to express appreciation can be a horrible sin. It must hurt God to, uh, to contemplate our ingratitude. I like what Shakespeare said, how sharper than a serpent's tooth it is to have a thankless child. You ever thought about that? How sharper than a serpent's tooth it is to have a thankless child. If, ingrat if in ingratitude grieves man, how much more must it grieve our Father in heaven? And because of us being ungrateful for what that he's done for us. We find ourselves in deep prayer and meditation and seeking the Lord when things are not going too well and prosperity has not seemingly favored us at all. But when all of a sudden uh, the, uh, the cash flow begins to change its direction and raises come in and other things begin to uh, increase our income, if we're not careful, we'll find that our outgo goes in another direction, but not to the Lord. Because we're not grateful for what God's done for us. It's easy to get like that. And, we, uh, and fo uh, folks have gotten in those, in those shapes so, so many, many times. Uh, and we all can say with David, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. 
God has been good to us far better than we ever deserve. And I'm glad that he has been. If God had dealt with us according to our sins, not one of us would be left to tell the story. Psalms chapter 103 verse 10 expresses that. He, he has not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us after according to our iniquities. He's not done that. And I'm glad that he hasn't. In the hour of prosperity, God invites us to perpetuation. In the hour of success, God invites us to salvation. In the hour of health, God invites us to holiness. In the hour of riches, God invites us to redemption. In the hour of, 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 of contentment, God invites us to consecration. In the hour of peace, God invites us to, par to pardon. In the hour of fame, God invites us to faith. The gates on the south are open today. And this could be your finest hour. In the light of God's love and mercy, expressing your gratitude by according, by accepting Christ as your Savior. A China man had two shoes and had two shoes and had two feet, but the Chinese would get on the train, they would take off their shoes. And carrying their shoes, he got on the train and saw, and he saw one of his shoes had dropped off, and he jumped off the train to get the other shoe. He slipped getting back on the train, got in one of the, and his foot slipped under the wheel of the train, and he lost one foot. But later on, we find now he has two shoes and one foot. Better to have two feet and one shoe than to have two shoes and one foot. You need to just be careful. And then lastly, on the west end, there are three of them. The west represents the setting sun, the symbol of old age. Nicodemus asked this question, can a man be born when he is old? Now, Nicodemus was thinking about going back into the mother's womb and uh, re re you know, regressing and uh, you know, being, uh, going back and then being born again. He, I did not know anything about the new birth, but Jesus was going to tell him. And Jesus never got into a debate with him about it. So many uh, folks, when you get talking about religion or salvation, they want to get debatable about spiritual matters. But the simple truth is that you just want to present the simplicity of the gospel and give it to them and that Christ died for sinners and all that they've got to do is accept, repent of their sins and ask him to save them and he'll do just that. But if we get into theological debate about all the religious practices and everything that's going on, uh, we've done missed the boat altogether. We, we, we've turned down another stream and we've lost their, uh, uh, their attention and everything else. We need to keep it simple, straight, and straightforward and honest and that Jesus saves and that's the only way a person gets to heaven. Amen. There's not another way we'll ever get there right, right, right. except by the blood of Jesus Christ. You'll never find anything in this world that will ever satisfy God Almighty except the, the applying of the blood of his son on your sins and my sins as well. Amen. And when you do that, you're going to find God smiling. Because then when he looks upon me and looks upon you, you know what he sees? The righteousness of the Son of God. Amen. And therefore, I'll stand in this place as righteous because he's righteous. It is difficult to be saved in old ways, but it's not impossible. Habits are fixed when the tent of life is pitched towards the west when you're young. And if you pitch your tent towards the west when you're young, you'll discover that habits are going to be uh, developed in your life that's going to be heartbroken. And of course, you're going to find that it's going to be difficult and one habit leads to another thing, another thing to another thing. And you get so uh, wrapped up and swept away in all the things that's going to, in the setting of the sun begins to come into a person's life. But I'm glad that God's always a God of a second chance. Amen. And he's always offering salvation to anybody and everybody just simply come. He just wants us to do that. I like about the Sunday school and the teacher, we've probably heard it before, the, and uh, uh, the, uh, the Sunday school teacher wanted the object lesson and for the class to bring one that had a Bible verse behind it. The first boy brought a, a, a salt shaker, and he said it represented this verse, you are the salt of the earth. And the teacher said, that's good. The next boy brought a match and he told the teacher it stood for that verse which states that you are the light of the world and he struck the match. The last boy, uh, boy brought a banny egg and the teacher said, Tom, I can understand the other objects, but what does yours represent? And the little boy held up the little banny egg and said she has done what she could. And you know what? She didn't have the big egg, but she did what she could. And that's what we need to be doing. We need to be doing what we can. If you do your best, God will reward it. Set the stage for the moment when you will give your all to Jesus for salvation and for service. Set the stage. The West is coming into our lives. 
It seemed like only yesterday that I was playing a, 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 a kids' games with my friends on the 24th Street where I was born and raised. And then now, it's, uh, I'm 73 years old, I've got my wife, we've got two kids, and five grandkids, and three great-grandkids. And all of a sudden, the West has come on quickly. And it won't take long, beloved, because you've got the East and everything's starting out, but all of a sudden the West is there, and we're headed towards the setting of the sun. And what we do for Jesus tonight is what's going to count. Salvation of service, which one is it going to be this evening? Let's stand to our feet, please. No one's looking around.